Thank you very much, John Luca. And it's now time for a call with Simonetta Di Pippo, who is an astrophysicist and current director of UNOOSA, the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs. And I just wanted to also share that in 2008, the International Astronomical Union assigned the name Di Pippo to an asteroid 21. 887 in recognition of Simonetta's effort in space exploration. So I wanted to share that. Warm welcome to us, Simonetta. How are you? Fine, thank you. And you? I'm fine. We have an intense but interesting asteroid day here today. I wanted to start off with talking a bit more about um, UNOSA, who promotes international cooperation in the peaceful use and exploration um, of space. I just thought, could you just tell us briefly what um, you are currently working on when it comes to planetary defense? Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, first of all, let me mention that the International Asteroid Day was uh, uh, was uh, decided by the United Nations um, recently uh, with the idea of uh, raising public awareness of uh, an asteroid impact hazard and uh, also uh, wants to raise awareness with the public, I mean, to and, and, and in the public, of the global work undertaken by the Office for Outer Space Affairs, as you were mentioning. Um, well, uh, the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs works to bring the benefit of space to humankind. So you could say it's quite a broad mandate that we have. And under this, uh, let's say, broad mandate, uh, and as one of an important I mean, topic that we, we deal with, um, we also uh, serve as the secretariat of the Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, and both the office and the committee uh, have already recognized since long the fact that an asteroid, a potential asteroid impact is a global concern. And therefore, in uh, the recent past, uh, certain recommendations have been uh, endorsed um, for an international response to a potential neo uh, impact threat. So um, this resulted in, a, in, a, in, a, in the establishment of two groups. One is called the International Asteroid Warning Network, IOWN, and the second one is called Space Mission Planning Advisory Group, same page, and both groups have the, um, let's say, the objective and the goal to implement these recommendations. Now, we, the Office for Outer Space Affairs, work closely with both same page and IOWN. In particular, we also serve as the Secretariat of same page. And just to clarify a little bit, I1 is an international association of institutions which are involved in detecting, tracking, and characterizing NEOs to provide the best information available on a potential NEO hazards, and so any potential impact threat. Uh, same page uh, instead is, is made of uh, national space agencies and governmental and intergovernmental entities, and um, its responsibilities include um, defining the framework, timeline, and options for initiating and executing space mission response activities, as well as promoting opportunities for international collaborations on research and techniques for neo deflection. So, as you can imagine, the work of these two um, working groups or, uh, let's say, activities are really important. And uh, working with them, and also considering the last week, we celebrated the 50th anniversary of the first United Nations uh, Global Conference on the Exploration and Peaceful Use of Outer Space for Space Plus 50. We took the occasion, considering also the International Asteroid Day upcoming tomorrow, and we published uh, a booklet which is called Near Earth Objects in the Planetary Defense, and I'm showing it to you. Mm -hmm. You can find it on our website, on the website which has been done together with these two. Uh, and uh, as I said, the office of the space of Earth, mm -hmm. and it's a, a let's say a group of speech for the public of what we are trying to do right. to put this field and try to be ready in case we have to deal with the defense in a threat. Thank you so much, Simonetta, and also we applaud the work that you're doing with creating sustainable development and making the world a better place, and also for you being a role model to get more women and girls into the space sector. And with that, I'd like to hand over to Brian and his next panel. Thank you, Sabinia. The next panel is uh, something we hope we only talk about and not have to deal with. It's what happens when asteroids hit. And um, 
joined for the first time by Debbie, Debbie Lewis. So thank you for joining us. You're a member of the Asteroid Day expert panel. Um, what is the response? What, 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 what would happen if, if an asteroid hits us? What are we expected to do? Sort of live un underground bunkers for <laughs> months until things settle down? I mean, obviously it depends on the size of the object, but let's say a reasonable, a Tunguska size object mm. initially. Um, well, I think, well, Brian, first of all, thank you. Thank you very much, and, uh, and it's great to be here. Um, and I think, you really, your first question very much highlights the need for the emergency management communities, working very closely with the scientific community. Because, as you say, there's a lot of uncertainty um, with the size of the object coming in, um, and particularly in terms of warning time or preparation time and that kind of thing. Um, so I think there's a very clear distinction between sheltering from a Tunguska-style um, um, uh, meteor hazard um, and evacuation. Um, and, of course, the impact effects um, are obviously very, very crucial um, to understand, and certainly the impact effects on people. Um, because very much, yes, scientists look at, uh, and understandably, the impact effects on the ground, um, but it's how people would be affected um, were an asteroid to, uh, to, to you know, collide uh, with us. So I think it's very important to understand. I mean, disasters are about people at the end of the day, um, and that's certainly the side that I'm very interested in, how we protect people. Um, so. And do we have the precision in terms of our knowledge of if, if, if we see an asteroid coming in? Uh, do, do we have eno enough precision to understand how to evacuate? Because you can't evacuate an entire country, <laughs> for example. So, so is, are we precise enough in our knowledge? Um, not, not yet, um, but I think certainly, you, you know, there are, there are moves um, in, in place to make sure that um, in a few years that, yes, we are able to, to uh, obtain that precise tracking information, the characterization. Um, and again, this is why the work that is being undertaken by scientists, engineers, uh, etc., you know, their work is absolutely crucial and certainly why uh, detection and the follow-up uh, missions are so, so um, absolutely vital in order to, to obtain that information, not just for um, putting mitigation methods together, but for putting contingency planning arrangements together. Because, yes, you're absolutely right. If it happened tomorrow, where would we go to? Who would know what to do? And that, for me, is a big, big gap um, in how you sort of warn, inform and advise members of the public, the community, um, in how to prepare for disasters of this nature. I just want to jump to Mark, actually, because in terms of the threat, um, what, what scale of threat are we talking about? Because people are perhaps more familiar with uh, nuclear weapons and we sort of understand what they do. So how would you, uh, at Tunguska scale event, how does that scale? That's, that's right. And, and so a nuclear explosion is a release of an enormous amount of energy that we measure in megatons. Uh, uh, and uh, that's the equivalent of a megaton of TNT all going off at once. So Tunguska also very suddenly released energy in the atmosphere, and we estimate from the effects, the tree fall, and, and from the seismic effects and effects on the atmosphere, that it was at least a five megaton event, and maybe uh, even significantly bigger, 10, 15, even 20 megatons. So, so the, one of the fundamental laws of physics is that energy is conserved and TNT stores its energy chemically and it can be very quickly uh, released by a shock wave and so the, the chemical bonds are broken, energy is released before anything has time to really move or expand. In fact, it compresses and you get a, a white hot, very high pressure ball of vapor that pushes outward and expand and, and, and creates a, a large shock wave and an explosion and anything that shock wave touches is damaged. And something very similar happens when an asteroid comes into the atmosphere at high velocity, but the energy content in terms of kinetic energy is actually much higher. So uh, the Chelyabinsk object that exploded over Russia five years ago um, came in at 19 kilometers per second. Uh, gram per gram, that's about got about 40 times as much energy as TNT, and that's why it was such an enormous explosion. And that shock wave got all the way to the ground and blasted out windows. Yeah. So the smaller scale impacts, uh, we, we, we sort of know uh, because we know about our weapons. Is that, and they're at the scale of our weapons at the moment. The bigger ones, though, 
That's right. And, and, and a lot of what we understand about the effects of an asteroid airburst or impact come from nuclear weapons tests and studying the way nuclear uh, explosions happen in the atmosphere and on the surface. Yeah. Um, Eric Bettini, so, so welcome to Asteroid Day. So you're the curator of a uh, geophysical and astrophysical collections at the Museum of Natural History here in Luxembourg. Um, what role do museums and educational institutions play in um, I suppose, raising awareness about asteroids? And, but I should emphasize we, we're talking today about the positive and negative aspects of asteroids. This is just a rather negative panel at the moment, but it's, <laughs> the other ones have been quite positive. Well, I think the world is, is very essential, but uh, it's not only in museums, it's also in schools, planetariums, uh, science centers, and so on. And um, I think that um, we should more or less play the counterpart of social media, because we know what happens in social media, it really goes to catastrophism, and our role in, um, in museums is really to, to stay on, on scientific facts. Of course, um, what you have to do is um, using the language of the, of the people uh, and also for, for, for kids using language and at their level of understanding. But um, what I want to say is also we, we have to start now because um, people should be prepared of such an event. And uh, it's, it's quite similar to people living in earthquake uh, countries. They are prepared for a bigger event in earthquake. Mm -hmm. So what we have to do is really start now to, to rise awareness for people and that they are prepared of what could happen. And uh, of course, if you have a, a big event, uh, we can not do very much, but uh, also be prepared on, on less uh, uh, smaller events. So that's our mission and it's a fascinating job too. Uh, Patrick, what's the history the, uh, of, uh, that we know of, of impact events? We've talked about Tungus Tunguska. But um, in terms of going back through recorded history, what, what do we know? Yeah, what do we know? It's an interesting question because uh, it's very hard to know on Earth, at least, because, of course, the Earth is made of two thirds of water. Uh, we have erosion, we have plate tectonic, we have uh, a lot of things that erase, basically, the crater features. Uh, so, in fact, there are at least about 190 identified craters on Earth. And I think the database is in Austria to the people who were on Skype uh, earlier. earlier. And, uh, but these are just the identified craters. It doesn't mean there are, there are not others. To, so to really understand the history of these impacts, like, let's say how much frequent it is, is very difficult because we, we um, identify them at random. So, uh, so first, also at random, the location is totally random. Also, there is no preferred location of impact. And when you see the map of all the impacts, is, there is no preferred location. So the best witness is uh, actually the moon, because there is no erosion, etc. And this is how we could uh, estimate the impact frequencies, which we can then easily calibrate with Earth, because we have also dynamical models. And this is how we know, or at least we estimate, that there is a dinosaur killer kind of asteroids 10 kilometers in diameter that impact the Earth on average every 10 million years, every 100 million years, sorry, 100 million years. Worried, then. No, 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 every 100, <laughs> well, even 10 million years, I'm not sure I would it's worry much. He hasn't told us but, about uh, <laughs> we have a one kilometer object impacting every, every 500,000 to 1 million years on average. So, so how big is that one? Uh, one kilometer. One kilometer. Yeah. So we have error bars, and huh? we are not economists, we can accommodate large error bars, although economists also have error bars. Then we have a 100 meter size asteroid every 10,000 years on average, and the Tunguska-like event is about every 1,000 years. So you mm -hmm. see, we, we are able to, uh, to uh, let's say, calibrate from the moon the impact frequency on Earth, and it shows that fortunately, the, the big events remain very rare, and only the very local events become more and more frequent. But many, when we say local, of course, be, because there are two thirds of, of, of the Earth which is covered by water, and actually uh, only a few percent is uh, uh, populated, the probability that a very local event impacts a populated area remains very small. So we have this mm. which uh, saves us. But, it, but, but as, as Debbie spoke of earlier, then the most likely scenario is an, an evacuation of a small area. We're not really talking about civilization scale events, we hope. 
Absolutely, yes. Um, and it's the smaller events um, which there could be more of because, yes, there's smaller, more, uh, smaller objects. Um, so, of course, the risk increases. Um, it's the same with flooding. You know, you have the 100-year floods, and then, which thankfully don't happen very often, but then it's the smaller floods which are much more localised. So, so very much the, the hazard posed from asteroids, uh, etc., is very much in that vein. Um, and particularly, well, I mean, they, they happen very frequently. I mean, one was just a couple of days ago. Um, and relatively, up until now, they've been quite benign. Um, unless, uh, you know, unlike the, the Chelyabinsk, when that was anything but. And so, yes, but just being able to sort of warn, inform and advise people um, that when you see this sort of strobe of brilliant white light flashing across your window uh, and you're working in your office or you're at home or you're at school, you know, the, the first thing we'd like to be able to say to people is, don't go to the window. And curiosity, you would want to go to the window. Mm. So it's very much, no, don't. That's the very last place that yes, you need to go. Absolutely, and because so and that's what happened, and people were injured. Um, so to sort of save people, I mean, prevention is better than cure. Yes. Um, and I'm sure the people in Chelyabinsk would have, would have much preferred to have been warned, informed and advised of an event like that to save them from going near the windows. Yeah. Um, and it's that very much that kind of thing, and it's the point that, um, that Matt was saying, um, that... Um, um, that it's, it's the education, very similar to earthquakes. And I know in Japan they do earthquake drills. Mm. Um, and it would be fantastic if in schools, you know, we had an asteroid drill. Um, so that, you know, children could sort of go under the desks and that kind of thing, or they're at home or it's a weekend or that kind of thing. Just so that people, so it's, so it's automatic. I want to ask Matt, actually, because <laughs> you're a, we've been very quite negative in this particular panel on the threat of asteroids. But in terms of a, you know, a, an amateur astronomer, someone who gets interested in astronomy, uh, how, how much of a role do they play in well, inspiring people as well as, well, frightening it's not them, frankly? doom and gloom. I mean, I, I'm going to support the asteroids here because this new era of asteroid discovery means that I think we're seeing the solar system, in fact the universe, in quite a different way. Because when you go out on a dark, clear night and you look up at the stars, they don't appear to change from night to night. But actually, it's this buzzing hive of activity with hundreds of trillions of objects from the size of a pea to the size of dwarf planets all swarming around you. you you can't see it, but you know it's there. Then you imagine that there's probably something similar happening around hundreds of billions of other stars, and there's even objects going between stars. Like last year, we had Oumuamua, which may or may not be an interstellar visitor, and there's a very strange object called 2015 BZ509 that orbits backwards like a car driving the wrong way around the M25. Yeah. And sooner or later, we're going to get a sample from one of these things. And, you know, the first man-made object was launched in 1957, the Sputnik. That's the year I was born. And in 2013, the Voyager 1 spacecraft left the solar system. So within my lifetime, we've gone from being Earthbound to being an interstellar species. And when we bring a sample back from one of these interstellar asteroids, what well, we're going to touch the soil of an alien world from an alien star system. Now, how amazing is that? Yeah. <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's actually a wonderfully positive place to end this panel. So, we'll, uh, but, so, so yes, thank you all very much. And now over to Jean-Luca. Thank you very much, Brian. And uh, so far, we connected with astronomers observing from places which are west from Luxembourg. And now we are really flying far into east, and we are very happy to join and welcome here uh, another important guest. He is Seitaro Urakawa, part of the Japan Space Guard Foundation, and I'm very happy to welcome you. And uh, I hope that you are observing. I know that there is a bright full moon, but I wanted to ask you what is happening there at your observatory? Uh, thank you. Hi, Gianluca. Uh, I'm happy, uh, a part of the, uh, uh, I'm happy to take part in the Astrodo Day, such a great day for Japanese. The first of all, my football team get, get through the group league. <laughs> and the second is Hayabusa 2. Oh, great. <laughs> reached, arrived to the new group. Unfortunately, I cannot read it, but I. <laughs> it is, but I, I trust it is a great thing. Oh, okay, the the, uh, the, the right now. Uh, 
unfortunately, it is rain now. Oh, I understand. We have been talking with people observing from the US, from the Catalina, Sky Sarven, mm. Pan Stars, and they were actually uh, they were facing the full moon, which is something okay. We have to handle, we have to deal with. And I was wondering if you had something special, if you observed something special recently, and uh, um, if you wanted to share this with us, because I always, I'm always interested to learn how observers, especially uh, uh, asteroid observers, uh, prepare and, uh, I mean, look through their telescopes to enjoy these amazing objects. Ah, for example, I, I uh, try to observe the small and fast rotation asteroid. So I, I, I saw that you also made some a wonderful light cure just to, to find the rotational speed of these objects. So you are not only doing astrometry, just studying the positions, you are also doing some physical studies, I see. Yes, that's right. The, uh, I estimate the rotation period because the, uh, this object, the rotation period is only three minutes. Wow. So uh, sorry, uh, this is uh, uh, in Japanese. Uh, X axis is a uh, uh, time, and uh, Y axis shows the uh, brightness. I understand. So we can estimate the uh, rotation brightness from the ro uh, 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 rotation period. So are you, are you uh, I mean, contributing to this kind of observations, I mean, uh, rotational studies regularly, or this was just a special case for you? Yeah, yes, that's right. It's, uh, usually I observe the NIAS object uh, that, that is list up to the website of the Minor Planet Center. Okay. Thank you very much, Seitaru. We will join you later again. And uh, for now, thank you for joining us. And it is for me a pleasure to hand over again to Sabine. Thank you very much, John Luca. And for us, it's time to go to Cyprus and learn from George Trulias what is happening in Astro Day Cyprus. Good afternoon, George. You also, you've got two other companions beside you. What's going my on over there? My left hand. <laughs> Good. Three hands. So what's what's happening? Hello, Luxembourg. Hello, world. Hello. Tell us, how's the day been so far? With, uh, we have uh, organized 12 events here. Wow. Nationwide, and we are promoting uh, the awareness on asteroids and uh, trying to find ways to prevent asteroid impacts. Mm -hmm. uh, we are on the asteroid day a search campaign and the Catalina Sky Survey. Uh, we also uh, made a publication to the IEEE through the Russian Technological uh, um, Institute, and we are promoting uh, asteroid research by using all available technologies and the, through, and the use of internet. And in this one, we mentioned our cooperation with Virtual Telescope and our friend Gianluca Wasi mm -hmm. and the Tenagra Observatories. <laughs> Great. So there's collaboration going on, I can hear. So how has the interest for Asteroid Day risen in Cyprus this year compared to last it's, year? It's growing year by year. And not only the only interest for asteroids, but uh, the interest for astronomy in general. Mm -hmm. And tonight, we are celebrating Asteroid Day with an astro party. And we are expecting approximately 5,000 people in Lima. Wow, congratulations. Worth and an applaud. At the, moment, at the moment, we have upstairs at the planetarium a group of children uh, being taught about uh, asteroid mining. And they are hosting a robotics workshop for creating uh, an explorer. Wow. Applause to that. We're also creating explorers here in Luxembourg. Thank you so much, and keep up the good work. Thank you very much. Bye. Okay, so I'm from Cyprus. We go to another part of the world. It's time to go to Puerto Rico and welcome Sean Marshall. How are you doing, Sean? Hello, good morning. Good morning, or uh, good afternoon here, but yeah. Yeah, time zones. <laughs> time zones. So tell us, what's been going on in Puerto Rico today? All right, so I'm here at the, the Arecibo Observatory and uh, 
we are we have the largest planetary radar facility in the world, mm -hmm. uh, 300 meter dish. So I always tell people radar is unique. Uh, we control the signal that goes out, and we can measure distances to asteroids directly. Mm -hmm. Useful for. And how is, how is the awareness being risen more and more when it comes to asteroids in Puerto Rico? Because I know, for example, you've had other catastrophes, like you had a hurricane um, last season, and luckily your observatory, observatory survived and so forth. But, but is there sort of an increasing yearning to want to learn more about the impact of asteroids, for example? Well, we always try to get as many students in here as we can. Mm. Uh, they're always uh, excited to hear about what we're doing. Mm. So just try to build the enthusiasm mm. That's, and sorry. get them all interested in science. Because mm. did you have any ongoing youth incentives at the moment? Uh, well, we have uh, student groups visiting our visitor center all the time. Uh, we have a group of summer students here from across the country, various projects, mm -hmm. including Astro. Great. Sean, to you and the team, thank you so much for your contribution to Asteroid Day. Have a, have a great day. And with that, I'd like to hand over to Lisa. Thank you, Savinia. And with me now from Tomorrow Street, we have one of our sponsors, Stefan Macar. Thank you so much for joining us and also for being one of our sponsors. Mm -hmm. Firstly, could you explain to our audience what Tomorrow Street actually is? Well, thank you for the introduction, Lisa, and it's a real pleasure to be here today. Um, so Tomorrow Street, it's Vodafone's Global Innovation Centre. And what it is, it's been set up as a joint venture between Vodafone and Technoport, and Technoport's the national incubator based here in Luxembourg. Now, the real vision of Tomorrow Street is to work with small companies or later stage startups and then help them grow and scale their business on a global level. And we do that by using Vodafone's footprint. And so you talk about the small companies and wanting to help them kind of branch out. We're here talking about asteroids in space. Do you have any such uh, space companies on your horizon? Um, we don't particularly focus on space-related startups, but at Tomorrow Street we look after sort of three technology pillars, so Internet of Things, Artificial Intelligence and Security. Uh, now I believe these are areas that can uh, help space startups on their journey. So for us it's about sharing our learnings with the community um, and being part of that, that process that they go through. So who knows what the future will hold though. Well I know artificial intelligence is one of those three pillars and it probably will become very important for people who may want to colonize the moon or Mars exactly. or both or beyond yeah. as we've been hearing this afternoon. And so with the AI companies that you have coming on board and I know Luxembourg with its Burst Resources Initiative you've probably got a lot of conversations going on on a governmental level here too. Uh, yes, so we, we do uh, interact with the government quite a lot here. Um, Technoport uh, is funded by, by the Luxembourg government, so they are one of our partners and uh, we do have some of those discussions. And as a sponsor, it's, it's wonderful for us and we need the sponsors of course, what does that bring to you tomorrow street? Um, I think if you look at the space industry, uh, it's really uh, the frontier where the mindset of a startup is uh, quite similar because it's all about taking a leap into the unknown and then making the impossible uh, possible. And then if we look to the past um, with the mission to the moon, um, the inventions that have been born from that project, something as simple as the computer mouse, uh, NASA actually funded that project and it's used by millions of people every day and there's countless examples of those innovations um, that we've seen from the space industry. So for Tomorrow Street it's about keeping in touch, uh, seeing what the latest innovations are and then um, really sponsoring Asteroid Day, it's the perfect way for us to be involved and see some of the key players in the ecosystem. Thank you so much. As you rightly said, so many of our new and now daily things that we use every day, including mattresses even, yes. were developed in space centres. And yeah. so who knows what is there for us in the future. And with that, I'd like to now hand over to Brian for the next discussion.